Yes, sir. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. And we beseech Allah's peace, His supreme peace. And we beseech His benedictions, His supreme benedictions. On our master Muhammad. Allah. In order to appear to me of perfection for ancient generations as well as the present generation. Amen. And we beseech Allah's benedictions upon the purified family of Muhammad. Allah. The topic of my presentation is on the history of Islam in the Americas. And, you know, a lot of times when we study history, we look at history as nothing more than a bunch of dates and the names of people. But history is, it's something living. It's, history is something organic. We study history not just to study the past, but we study history to understand our current state as well as to chart, our, chart out our future. Islamic history in the Americas is especially important in this post 9 11 society because all too often when people think about Muslims and Islam in America, we look at it as a recent aberration as opposed to an institution, a philosophy, a religion, a concept that has been in the Americas, both North, South, and Central America. For several centuries now, uh, Islam has been in the Americas now at least, uh, according to some recent historians, since at least 800 AD. Um, and during the course of my, my brief presentation, uh, we'll see that what I'm talking about kind of touches on some of the other presentations. Uh, touches on uh, community, dawa, and education. It's extremely important to recognize that neither Muslims or Islam is monolithic. And Islam's expression in the Americas has been in front of many of us, but it's been a matter of whether we've recognized it or not. When we look at Islam in the Americas, we have to look at it in terms of three distinct periods, pre-Columbian or pre-Columbus and the colonization period. Uh, we look at the post-World War I era and we look at the last few decades. Allah reminds us in the Quran to study history. He says, Having not been traveled in the land and seen what was the end of those before them. So, as I go through this presentation, reflect on that verse, please. When we look at the pre Columbian period or the pre Columbian colonization period, uh, one of the legendary aspects of that, about this period is the journey of the, of the Malian uh, Sultan, Abu Bakr II. He was from the Senegambia area. Uh, his empire was known as the Malayan Empire. And he came to the Americas approximately 1310 AD. According to some historians, he landed in the Mississippi Gulf. He brought a fleet of uh, was, uh, two fleets consisted of 2,400 ships. <coughs> okay, and his soldiers, it appears, traveled throughout the American Southwest. Some headed up the Mississippi, the Mississippi River. Others went through, went into Central America, as well as into South America. We have artifacts, and especially in Central America and South America, of Malaya, the Malayan sculptures, in particular in Peru, uh, around 1380, was found a, a sculpture of a Malayan head, and the head is wearing a fez. Okay, so we know this is, again, this is a, at least 100, almost 200 years prior to Christopher Col Christophe Colon, his, his uh, actual name, landing in the Americas. We also know 
from linguistical studies uh, conducted by uh, an art historian by the name of Alexander von Waffenau, who was a German art historian, whose uh, primary uh, historical emphasis was on art in Mexico, but he also delved into linguistics. And we know from the work of uh, Dr. Ivy Van Sertelman, who was from Guyana, that there are certain words in Native American uh, languages in Central America as well as in South America that have Arabic, that have Arabic words already in them. And they can, date from the, they can date the time that these words actually were introduced into these languages. And those dates coincide with Abu Bakr and the second fleet arriving in the Americas. Uh, we have a uh, Harvard professor, Dr. Barry Bell, Dr. Barry Fell, who has conducted uh, some historical studies in the American Southwest, primarily in Colorado and Nevada and California, where he's found that there were actually Muslim schools that existed. He's found what appears to be North African, or actually Kufic, Kufic calligraphy, engraved in some of the engraved in rocks. Okay, and then he also determined from his study that the Muslims were stuck in that. And I have to tell you, the year, the year that he's approximating is, is circa 900 AD. And Dr. Fell said that these Muslims were conducting, were uh, studying uh, sea navigation, they were studying history, they were studying geography, they were studying film. This is in the American Southwest. Now, okay, all right, I'm going to try to wind this up. Just to give you another example of, uh, linguist of the linguistic uh, aspect uh, as far as the Native American and Muslim interaction. We have a state known as Kentucky. And in the Indian, Kentucky means a dark or bloody ground. Dr. Fell noted that the way that, that because of the way Kentucky sounds, it more closely resembles Turkish. The Turkish operation word painta, which means the exact same thing. He also noted that when this word was introduced into Native American, uh, Native American language, which was approximately 1500 AD, that's about the time Ottoman sailors were starting to appear on the East Coast of North America. We know this to be, uh, to be uh, truth indeed because Columbus, when he came over, came over to the Americas, on his ships, not only were West African Muslims, they were also, he also had Ottoman sailors on board with him. He needed, he needed their expertise in sea navigation. We also know that Dr. Fell also discovered that with the name Chicago, it means a nasty, smelly, uncultivated place. Okay. <laughs> For those of you from Chicago, no offense. <laughs> but this corresponds to the Turkish word Chicago, which means the exact same thing. We also see the uh, appearance in, in Hispanic last names and Hispanic surnames in the American Southwest of a Muslim influence. We see last names such as Gez, Zomaris, Mar Morabatin, Morabios. We see these names, they all, especially Morabatin and Morabios, they come from the Arabic Morabatun. In particular, amongst the West African Muslims of America, we had what was known as Marabu amongst them. So we see the remnants of their neck of uh, their positions here, even in the Native American languages. Now, going to the colonial period, the colonial period is an interesting period, especially amongst the Spanish. The Spanish had a, had a big problem with Muslims. The Muslims were more prone to revolt. When we talk about slavery. The Muslims were more prone to revolt than, than some of the other slaves. 
So, 1526, the first anti-Muslim legislation was offered in the Western, Western Hemisphere. The Spanish decided they were not going to introduce any more Muslims into Central and South America to be slaves. It was becoming too problematic. Uh, you had Muslims revolting in San Juan, Puerto Rico. You had Muslims revolting in Peru. You had Muslims revolting in Chile and Ecuador. Now, mind you, this is only 20 years after Columbus's uh, introduction to the Americas. So, the first slave insurrection actually took place on the uh, plantation of Columbus's son, Diego. The Muslims, they ransacked the entire plantation. In fact, they ransacked the entire island of the, of the uh, Dominican Republic. And so because of that, the Muslims were costing the Spanish too much money. So the Spanish decided they weren't going to bring any more Muslims into <laughs> the Americans. Okay. And then, but on top of that, the Muslims had this attitude that, no, I cannot serve anybody other than a law. Whether you are by physical master or not is irrelevant to them. There was an interesting dialogue between a Muslim uh, uh, slave and his, uh, and his uh, owner. The owner asked the Muslim, you know, why do you still choose to keep to this religion? I'm your owner. And the Muslim told him, he said, you're my owner in, uh, in physicality only. I serve no one but Allah. Your presence is irrelevant to me. Salawat. Muhammad Muhammad. The same Muslim also told his owner, you wish to bring me to a religion that you yourself don't even follow. <laughs> this was the attitude of the Muslims. You, teach, you, wish to, you wish to teach me about Jesus. But the Jesus I but the Jesus I, I know of he doesn't drink wine. The, G the Jesus I know of doesn't eat pork. This was the Muslim's response. The Jesus I know of wouldn't treat, wouldn't treat his slave in the manner that you treat me. And you wish me, you wish for me to come to your religion. This was the Muslim attitude. And this is why both the Spanish and the Portuguese have very problematic issues with the Muslims. The English, they found out the hard way. Uh, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Barbados, uh, Muslims <coughs> began to revolt in the 1600s and the 1700s, and which is why the uh, English were one of the first to abolish slavery. They saw that it, it, it really meant nothing. There was no need to, to continue further with this institution. All right, inshallah, in the breakout sessions, we can go further. This is a very interesting subject for any of concern. Two good books, Servants of Allah, African Muslims Enslaved in the Americas, and the African Presence of Ancient America that came before Columbus. Inshallah.